Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you and welcome to the last in our current series of Doha Debates, coming to you from the Gulf state of Qatar and sponsored by the Qatar Foundation. The old regimes in Egypt and Tunisia may have been swept away, but elsewhere in the Arab world, a number of governments are fighting for their survival. Repression, violence and intimidation have been their weapons of choice, but with varying results. Tonight, we look at their chances of survival. How effective has brutality been in Yemen, in Syria, or in Bahrain? Have those and other governments fought off the challenge to their leadership, or are they fatally wounded from within? Has their reputation been badly damaged? And will the international community ever accept them back into the fold? All questions that lie at the heart of our motion. This House believes that resistance to the Arab Spring is futile. Our panelists are, as usual, de deeply divided. Speaking for the motion, Anwar Bukhas, Professor of International Relations at McDaniel College in the US and a consultant for Jane's Intelligence Review. And with him, Nadim Khoury. He's the Human Rights Watch researcher for Syria and Lebanon, a lawyer by training. He's also worked as an investigator for the UN. Speaking against the motion, Jane Kinnanmon, Senior Research Fellow at the Royal Institute for International Affairs in London. She has reported widely on the Middle East and North Africa for The Economist magazine. And with her, Ahmed Ali al Mukheni. He's Vice Principal of the Said al Shakri Legal Training Center in Oman and strategic consultant for the country's first political think tank. Ladies and gentlemen, our panel. So now let me first of all ask Anwar Bukhas to speak for the motion. <clears throat> Thanks, Tim. Pleasure to be here. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, the Arab street has finally risen from its anguish. This extraordinary Arab awakening has demolished the myth that Arabs are doomed to be fatalistic losers, that their cultural mindset and political traditions are unsuited to democracy. The sight of millions of pro-democracy protesters from Libya to Yemen to Syria braving tanks and riot squads and uh, and the regime thugs and expressing the determination to replicate the historic feats of their um, counterparts in Tunisia and Egypt has set these uh, uh, preconceptions in, in fire. Skeptics of Arab democracy see the triumph of pro-democracy forces as, as unlikely, insecure, as transient. The moment that normalcy returns to the streets of Cairo and other major metropolitan areas in the Arab world, we are told freedom fever will lose its steam. The battle lines of the future will look eerily uh, or will resemble eerily those of the past. But the reality we are witnessing today in the Arab world is that the orthodoxies of the past do not hold much appeal in a region where youth aspire for a better life, for a life of dignity, development, and freedom. Make no mistake about it, this period of historic change in the Arab world will not be short, nor will it be easy, nor will it be without setbacks. There will be ups and downs, in the, in the years and uh, in the months and years ahead. But the forces of change driven by technology, demographics, and youths have been unleashed and there is no going back. With very few exceptions, every society in the Arab world today is feeling the pressure for political change. Whatever the outcome in the protracted conflicts in Libya, Syria, and Yemen, it's almost certain that these countries will look different in the years to come. Those regimes that have chosen to dig in or try to reassert their authoritarian controls would find only temporary uh, reprieve. Experience, theory, and history tells us that regimes who have lost their legitimacy cannot survive. Could you come to a close, please? Sure, and the legitimacy of the Syrian, Libyan, and Yemeni dictators is totally uh, spent. So they will be overthrown, if not now, then in the coming years. Thank you. Anwar Bukhas, thank you very much indeed. You say these countries aren't going to look the same, they could look worse, aren't they? As you speak, I mean, Arabs may not be doomed to repeat what they've had in the past, they're doomed to die. They're dying in very large numbers, as you know, around the region. That's not a good sign, is it? I mean, sure, that, that's fair. I mean, again, they It's fair. Well, how do you mean it's well, fair? Well, the expectation is that with the Syrian regime, its reaction, and, and the Libyan regime is no different from other reactions in But there's in no other sign that the Libyan, the Libyan or Syrian regime, Syrian regime at least, is cracking. I mean, where are the massive defections from the government? That's where are the massive defections from the army? You're not seeing them, are you? History tells us that, the, remember, the Syrian regime legitimacy is totally spent, right? 
given that the legitimacy is withered away, as I said, it's only a matter of time. I mean, before they are, they are swept away. True. The but history also shows you that if you have the levers of power in your hands, like the army and the security services, you're not going to lose. I'll take you back to Nicaragua in the 1970s. Well, let's, mean, stay the, with, let's stay with this the, region. Th let's fine. stay with this region. But, but history tells us, remember, the Nicaragua leader, I mean, he used force in 1975, he crushed the revolt, four years later he was swept away. The same thing we can expect in Syria. For now, the elite guard is staying with the regime, right? But we don't know where the stance of the army. Remember, the army in Syria is made up of conscripts. Yeah, but our motion is resistance is futile and the resistance seems to be killing a lot of people at the moment and keeping the status quo exactly as, where it is. As sad as it is, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's naive of us to think that change will be easy, that change will not go, I mean, through tribulations and through hardship. But as I say, in the midterm, in the next few years, there will be change. Wishful, and the thinking? Is Wishful thinking on your part? Uh, I mean, again, the empirical evidence demonstrates that it's not. Ah, okay. Anwar Bukas, thank you very much indeed. Now let me ask Jane Kinnaman, please, to speak against the motion. My colleague and I would like to make it very clear from the outset that we support people's rights. We do not support repression. But in addressing this motion, we think that we need to be realistic. Democracy for the Arab region is possible, and I believe it is desirable but it is not inevitable, at least not in the foreseeable future. It would be wonderful if we could see united popular movements peacefully persuading rulers to say yes to reforms and to embark on real meaningful democratic transitions. But what we're already seeing in most countries in the region is looking very different. There already is and there will be further intense resistance from governments who have many tools to draw on. Other groups too will be resistant to change, including members of ruling parties, uh, business elites who are gaining from the status quo, sometimes foreign powers, and anyone who feels that they will be losers from democracy. In Egypt and Tunisia, a key factor was not only the unprecedented solidarity of the opposition, but also the solidarity between the army on the streets and the people on the streets. Rulers were not able in those situations to really go through with the use of brute force. But force can work. It's interesting that we see more Arab countries today recruiting for their security forces overseas. Brute force can be particularly effective if it's combined with divisions in society, ideological, tribal, ethnic, or religious. We are seeing those divisions being exploited, uh, particularly in Syria, Libya, and in Bahrain. We saw this also in Iraq in 1991, where Saddam Hussein did manage to buy himself another 12 years in power. There will be a huge amount of propaganda and disinformation designed to exploit those decisions. But there is a difference between the short term and the long term. From a ruler's point of view, more, a few more years in power may seem worth it, but the national interest of these countries will be better served by allowing peaceful reform and trying to build a consensus behind it in society. Thank you. Jane Kinnaman, thank you very much indeed. Isn't the biggest thing in the favor of these revolutions that the attitude of the West has changed, the attitude of the international community has changed? No longer will they support or turn a blind eye to dictatorships as they did with Mubarak, as they did with Ben Ali in Tunisia. It's not going to happen. And that's, that's a big boost to the revolutionaries, isn't it? I'm not sure we're suddenly seeing a new, consistent, pro-democracy policy emerging from the West. Well, we're seeing things that have been said which haven't been said before. Obama message to Assad, be part of the change or get out of the way. You know, William Hague saying to Bahrain and other countries, deeply concerned by the unacceptable violence. Unacceptable violence. Mm. Governments must respond to legitimate aspirations of their people. We haven't seen that in a while from the West. Not in this region. Statements are important, but uh, in the case of Bahrain, it is really words rather than actions. Syria is rather different. Okay, well, but actually, they've cancelled some military contracts already with Bahrain. True, but that's really UK legislation kicking in, that there are restrictions on arms exports. I think for the most part, that alliance remains very strong. Syria has always had a problematic relationship with the West. Yeah, well, they were finessed in the past, but they're not going to be finessed now, are they? So, we, so, so this, is a, this is a big thing for the revolutionaries, isn't it? If the attitude of the West has really changed, if it's been shown to change, this is what could sw swing it their way, isn't it? I think it was important in Egypt. I'm not sure that policy towards the Gulf has changed very much. 
Okay, Jen Kinnaman, thank you very much indeed. Now could I please ask Nadim Khoury to speak for the motion. Sure. Look, no one likes to give up power on their own, and definitely not dictators in this region who have gotten used to sit at the throne for more than 30 or in some cases 40 years. They're not gonna give in without a fight. That is a fact. But what is going on here? What are the forces behind the Arab Spring? First, the wall of fear is falling down in the region. The wall of fear that has kept people from challenging authority, that have kept people from questioning their dictators, we're seeing those cracks in countries like Syria, where a few months ago it would have been impossible and people in cafes in Damascus would whisper. Two, what we're seeing is a collective yearning from deep down for things like freedom, social justice, uh, and a more representational form of government. And finally, what we're seeing Again, a very powerful force that my colleague talked about is a coming of age of a younger generation, people like you in the audience, who represent a big demographic bulge in our societies and who got tired of being marginalized. Now, what do you have in front of that powerful mix? You have dictators who've been around for 30, 40 years. Yes, in some countries, they still have the loyalty of their troops, but that's it. They are in free fall. They, are, they have already lost legitimacy. You know, President Assad can no longer go shop in Paris. They have already lost a lot of their internal support. Their violent crackdown is destroying their economy, and soon they will find it hard to pay those salaries of those soldiers and security forces that they need to keep on their side. Frankly, they are relying on some countries in the region, like Saudi Arabia and others, who are seen to be bankrolling the counter-revolution but that's not gonna help all countries the same way. The train has left the station. Of course, it's gonna take time. Yes, we all got used to Twitter. We all got used to sort of instant change, but you can't change countries that have been in the icebox for 30, 40 years in a week, in two months, or in three months. Could you come to a close? Please? Sure, and just because these uprisings are encountering some form of resistance, resistance that was expected, let's not minimize the dynamic nature of these movements, the courage of the protesters, and the wind behind their sail, because I am convinced that they will succeed. Nadim Khoury, thank you very much indeed. You say that uh, some of these governments that are pushing back and resisting uh, still have the loyalty of their troops, but that's it. That's everything, isn't it? As far no. as staying in power is concerned? No, because... They don't should... need the loyalty of their people because they were never elected anyway. They don't need the buy-in from the people, do they? Yeah, but you cannot run an economy when you've got your soldiers uh, in the streets of your cities. You cannot create jobs for that new demographic that you want to keep on your side if you don't get investment. And who's going to invest today? And isn't that today? the problem in Egypt? You know, they may have had their revolution, but what's, what's changed? They're ruled and, by a military junta. Yeah, well, not yet. I think let's wait to see the elections. And, you know, we're seeing the international uh, community But that's speculation. Help. What they've no, got look at, them, at what the what G8 just the promised moment. last week. I mean, they are going to shower Egypt and Tunisia with money. This is the sort of carrot approach. If, if it moves in the direction but, that they hope it will move. Right. There, are, there are big ifs look, attached here. Of course there's there are big There's a price tag to all this aid, isn't there? there? there there has never been a change without risk. But frankly, you know, the opposite side tells you about realism. What has realism given this region? What has it given us? It's giving us 40 years of rotten politics, of rotten economies. We can't export anything. We're not exporting ideas. We're not exporting goods except petrol that we're running out of. We're not producing anything. But you're all saying in the that name people are going to continue to come up and confront the army and the security services and get mown down. There's no shortage of people who are going to do that. Or well, comes a point when people say, okay, enough people have died, it's, a, it's not going to happen. Well, it's a battle of the wills. It's a battle of the wills, and I'll concede you that. But what, what I've seen so far is that the protesters have been more courageous, have been more patient than the actual armed forces. The Arab Spring does not mean unseating every single dictator, right? It's a menu of change. It can vary from, you know, the uh, getting rid of a dictator it may mean a regime uh, you know, change from an existing regime. We're seeing that in Jordan, we're seeing that in Morocco, uh, and we may see an effort by some of the countries to buy off the loyalty okay, of their Okay, but we citizens. haven't seen anything yet that can't be rolled back, can we? Well, of course, we've seen a lot that can be rolled back. I mean, let's not minimize that today, Mubarak is in jail. 
Okay, the Pharaoh of Egypt is in jail. And his army is still in power. We have to move on. Nadim Khoury, no, thank army. you. Could I please ask Ahmed Ali Mukheni to speak against the motion, please? Thank you, Tim. And ladies and gentlemen, I thank the honorable gentleman on the other side of the house for paving the way for our arguments. We, uh, my colleagues and my colleague and I, do believe that this is not a call for repression. It's a call for realistic reading on the ground. And we should not lump all the Arab countries together. Each country has to be treated differently. But we do believe that government resistance to the Arab Spring is not futile. It will bear fruit because of four reasons. Socially, we do not have social structures that will absorb and build up the momentum in order to achieve the critical mass to affect change. And all the demands have been portrayed either as the demands of the ungrateful or foreign collaborators, and both of them have driven people away and discouraged the wagon to be actually joined. Economically, my, my uh, colleague talked about economics. Economically, the GCC countries will fund all the resistance in the Arab world. They will not allow role models to exist, and they will be able to give more handouts and offer more jobs. Thirdly, they can make everything lawful. They can make laws, they can amend laws, they can actually manipulate the judiciary, and will make everything lawful. So they have the tools, and they would know how to play with it. And finally, politically, we are dealing with animals that are uh, very much endangered, and they would use their survival instinct. They will be merciless, they will devour everything in front of them. There will be no time for values, and if we want to see more bloodshed, then that's what you're going to see. And if I may end my uh, introduction here, let's not rely on EU and the European Union or the states or any external forces. They are manipulated, they have been, they will be. Thank you. Ahmed Ali al Mukheni, thank you very much indeed. If they're in such a delicate, parlous state, as you say, they may well fall apart internally. This is, this is the land of coups and unhappy families, isn't it? This is the region for it. Well, I don't think they will fall apart because they made sure that they have this nervous system going around. They've fallen together. apart in the past. No, they've fallen they apart in the past. They don't have normal transitions of power. They have they? been they have resilient. Coups. They have been resilient. Whatever coup they've had. They have fights. They have feuds. They uh, have internal disagreements. They left, right, and money center. speaks, Tim. Money speaks. They can buy everybody. They will buy everybody. And all the misery you see will be bought out in time. They're not buying the people who keep coming onto the streets time and time again. Uh, as, well, as, you as see, one of those on this side uh, has said, for the, the, time, the, the thing that's changed you know, is fear. And when there is no longer any fear among people, what, what levers do the dictators have? I what mean, levers do see, they have? We have several when examples. When people don't want their money okay. and they're not now afraid we have of them. What, what levers do they have? People will be defied. People will be kept you know, in their homes. They will be arrested. They will be prosecuted. But they did that in Egypt, and they did it in oh, Tunisia. Egypt is a different case. They okay? did it in Egypt and Tunisia. Different case. But you see, Egypt... But do you think the people in the Gulf are going to accept what the, what the people in Egypt and Tunisia well, have overthrown? You have to remember one thing, Tim. Egypt and Tunisia were taken by surprise. These people in the Gulf here, they have done their homework and they are going to make sure that none of the other countries would fall to allow for their failure. It's a last ditch move, it's a desperate move. It is, it? but they will make and it. And that won't last very long. If they, if they, well, they know have, the game's we, up. We know they? it is for the time being. The argument is for the time being, and for the time being, they But they, they know will that succeed. the game is up already, don't they? Well, they have they know the rules. Otherwise they, they wouldn't be so nervous. They are changing the rules. So insecure. They can change the rule of the game. They can do all of things. And they, you think the people will, will, will accept they, that? They do not hear the people, you know, you can actually move, mobilize them. But if you do not have structures to really amass that mobilization, you will not bear fruit. It will be just, you know, riffraffs, you know, waving flags in front of the government. That's it. Ahmed Ali al Mukheni, thank you very much indeed. Okay. All right, we're going to take your questions now on the motion. This House believes resistance to the Arab Spring is futile. Gentleman in the second row there in the red. Uh, my name is Abad Diab and I'm Syrian. People are now protesting because truth is now unveiled. No one can stop them because now governments will think twice before they act anything because whatever they will, whatever they will do, it will, it will be shown. Okay, Jenkin Amman, do you want to react to that? I agree it's very important 
Uh, it's very hard now for governments to cover up crimes, but there is a huge battle of information, of propaganda in the traditional and in the social media. Uh, there are pro-regime Syrians uh, going around the world telling people that everything you see has been faked by activists or is a conspiracy by uh, foreign satellite channels that we could name. Uh, so it's not clear yet who is winning that, that battle for ideas. And I think, again, in that space, there's going to be very, very fierce resistance. Let's, let's be honest here. Who is believing Syrian State TV? I dare anyone in this room to watch Syrian State TV for one hour without cringing. No one is. You know, when well, why they actually, are, they don't why even don't ask them? Why don't we ask them? You've posed the question. Does anybody well, here believe Syrian State TV? Well, first of all, who would actually watch Syrian State no TV? No one, no one. <laughs> that might be a better well, question. That, thank you very but, much. But, They've just made my point okay, for let me. Let me go back to the questioner here, because I, uh, are you, your claim is that whoever controls the social media is going to control power in the end. Yes, um, uh, uh, if, uh, what I'm saying is that if you have a mobile phone, if you have a mobile mobile phone and you can press a button that would send it to another country, which show the truth, this is a deafening tool to the to the regime because you're so showing. So in the end, the, the regimes you're saying can't resist this. Yes. But you see, you can mobilize people, but if these people do not fall into organized movement, you know, it's just a futile exercise. I mean, they will come, they pour in emotions, you know, will feel happy about what they've done, but then eventually, that's it. Tahrir Square oh, wasn't a futile that's... exercise, was it? What, sorry? Tahrir Square in Cairo was well, not a that, futile exercise, well, was it? Do you know how many times they actually mobilized people? In that month alone, there were 2,000 attempts, 2,000 attempts in Egypt alone that month to actually have a revolution. And they were crushed over and over again until they managed and to... They and they keep coming back. And they keep coming back everywhere. Well, it's, you're absolutely right. I mean, there is no denial that an Arab public sphere has, has emerged that is based on this blend of, you know, internet and at the same time also uh, print technologies, right? And uh, that public sphere, within that public sphere, Arabs have discovered their political voice. So that, that's where the strength, I think, of, of, of these uh, technologies, right. in addition to other elements, yes, because this is right. not a Twitter. It will take time, very long time. Well, People not... have suffered political starvation for 40 years, decades of political starvation. And you ex expect it doesn't them. mean they haven't been thinking, does it? That's a different story. People can think. They have. Well, they can they're, dream. They're, they're doing they're more than that in Egypt, Egypt very, and Tunisia and Syria. Daydreaming has been proven to be the main cause for thinking. you know depression. Daydreaming is the main cause for depression. Okay. Look, they are having me, depression. Sorry, let me get just, just, just one more point, and then I'm, I'm going to move on because there are lots of questions. Okay. Yeah, just I wanted to clarify something. So what, you, what the other side would have you believe is because there are no existing structures, no well-established political parties, transitions cannot happen. Sure. Well, you know what that sounds like? Like the argument the regimes are painting. Well, there are no alternatives. It's only us. It's Mubarak or chaos. It's sure. Assad or chaos. Well, that's not true. Who's to blame let for not having a political you, party? No, who's to blame let for me, not having a political party? No, please, if, no, if, no, there was, if there was a structure, Everyone would be in jail and there would have been no uprising. Yes, it is a challenge. No one is underestimating the difficulty of the transition. Okay, Again, you, you are getting something out of the me, ice box, sitting in a microwave after 40 We're years. We're talking okay, about okay, the okay, time let him, being. Let him come back on this. We're talking about the time being. The time being, any resistance will not be futile. It will succeed. If you talk about 10 years from now, perhaps. Different generation, different people, different interests. OK, but I'm going to move on. Uh, up there, lady at the back, yes. Uh, the opposition has claimed repeatedly that uh, they are pro-democracy, but isn't that what the Arab Spring is all about? The Arab Spring is a movement for democracy and for reform. So how is it futile? How is resistance to the Arab uh, Spring futile? Uh, you said so yourself that yes, in the Egyptian case, there were uh, several protests and they were crushed, but they succeeded in the end. So. How is it futile well, exactly? How, it's futile because of many reasons. I mean, the discussion we have had is that it is futile in the time being. You will not see immediate results. In Egypt, for example, it's been going on for years and years. On average, 300 to 500 protests or attempts to uh, do a coup against the regime every month. And in that month where it happened, there were about 2,000 going on. So it will take time. It's a wishful thinking. We, cannot, we do not say it's not going to happen. It will happen. Do not believe that just by going to the street, you will make change. You need strategies. And if I may go back to the issue of Yemen and people deposing their leaders, 
To my surprise, most of these people were just, be, you know, they were born on the moment. They did not have strategies. They do not have strategies. And they think if you have a strategy and you have people who are organized, you can be targeted and you can be you know, eliminated. But they have to take that risk if they want to succeed. We're not saying that the Arab Spring is futile. We're not saying that democracy movements are doomed to failure. What we're saying is that the forces yes. of resistance are very strong. They are forces to be reckoned with. Yes. The struggle is going to be long and hard. And you're betting on the forces of resistance, winning out at least in the short at, and at medium term. At least in term. the short term in some countries. I would distinguish between, for instance, Yemen, where I do think that Saleh's attempts to hold on to power are now futile. I think his days are numbered. And the situation in Bahrain, where unfortunately, uh, I think they are in you a, think a their worse days position. Are um, no, this is what I'm saying. I think that Salah's days are numbered. I think if you look at the situation in Bahrain, the democracy movement has been set back more than a decade by the recent events. Well, that, it's very. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that, that's why. I mean, pr protests may are going to follow different trajectories and, and, and in, in different places. I mean, in, in Libya and Yemen, I mean, it's fair to say that the regimes are done. In Syria, the outcome is going to depend, obviously, on endurance. I mean, how long can the protesters sustain it? Uh, sustain but answer Jane Kinnaman's point no, about, that's about fine. Bahrain, will But you? The, same thing, the same thing can be said about the regime. How long can the regime maintain, I mean, his security forces mobilized, uh, I mean, in a war mode? For how long can you go? For how long can he meet? Can, can they sustain How the cohesiveness of alone. the regime? I'm sorry? How long Egypt has been on, under emergency law? 35 years or something like that? These are different, th that's right, but these are different contexts. Continue. These are different contexts. People have seen what people power can accomplish. And the same thing is going to happen in Bahrain. I mean, you cannot continue repressing 70% of your population. So if you want to make a, 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 I mean a, a forecast of what's going to happen in the near term, it's either, very unfortunate, it's either there's going to be a resistance, right? When the, the street protests don't work, we move into different kinds of resistance. Why, why can't you go on repressing 70% of your population? If you have the power in your hands, you can that's go on doing when, it indefinitely. That, that's, when, that's when the power of street protests is fundamentally changed into violent resistance. You're not buying so that, that Jane the, Kinnaman. So, so that's where we are going into Bahrain. I also I, want to say, I mean, sorry, let me just... Can, uh, can we just get a, to answer that okay. and then come back on it? I think you're right. I think having failed uh, to be able to achieve things through the very weak parliament that hardly functions, um, I think that there are going to be more people uh, turning to violent resistance in Bahrain, but ultimately they're not really armed. They're going to, it's going to be an unpleasant thing. It's going to be an irritant, but I don't think that, that uh, re uh, resort to violence is actually going to be successful there either. Nadine uh, Khoury, you wanted to make uh, a point. Yeah, let's, I mean, we're talking about the Bahrain model, which seems to be now the model of sort of the so-called resistance to the Arab Spring. First of all, the resolution is it's futile. I mean, it takes time. The apartheid regime in South Africa, it took time to bring it down, but it was clear that history was blowing the other way. And it will be the same in Bahrain. You know, if Bahrain was so normal, if it managed to turn the corner, how come it still has to rely on GCC and Saudi troops to keep the peace? You know, we all saw those ads South of Africa Bahrain was in business a very friendly. difficult position, wasn't it? Well, and Bahrain will be the same. It was on its own. It was on its own. Bahrain yeah. is apparently surrounded by friends. Well, surrounded by friends with a lot of money, that's true. But you can't rule against 70% of your people today for very, very long. You know, little things, little things will start. I mean, take, let's take the example. Bahrain spent millions and millions of dollars on a campaign called Bahrain Business Friendly. I'm sure you've all seen those ads. Mm -hmm. What has that gotten them today? Their reputation is in tatters. No one would go invest there. So yes, their wealthy friends are going to spend money. And maybe in Bahrain, because it's a small population with a lot of money, they're going to be able to buy some time, more than some other countries. But it is futile. Maybe in Bahrain, they can buy five years or 10 years. In Syria, maybe they'll be able to buy one year. But, but that, that just means, okay, you know, me, it might take a year. No, but I think it's very important, because they may, they're, may, they're conceding, well, it's going to be hard in the short term. Of course, course it's okay. going to be hard well, in the short it, term. Uh, yeah, then the whole argument is time. You know, you have been going on and on and on about time. We do not disagree on the time, but we are talking about now, immediate and short term, mid term. You know, these powers would curb the momentum. If you curb the momentum, you have curbed the Arab Spring. I mean, okay. if, if you think the transitions, I mean, to, towards towards uh, towards democracy, I mean, are, are going to 
quickly materialize, you will be disappointed. I mean, you're talking here about, well, ten, they might happen in 10 years. Well, if it did happen in 10 years, that's not too bad. I mean, it, uh, look. He's not going to be disappointed. He's arguing the other way. No, that's fine. Well, <laughs> yes. that's exactly what he said. No, what he said is that, I mean, there might be a change in 10 years. And this is exactly what we're arguing. We're like revolutions take time. What we are seeing is just the beginning of a long process. I mean, even in peaceful revolutions, like in Egypt and Tunisia, it's going to take at least half a decade. OK, right, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to move on to so. a question from the lady in the front row there. Um, good evening. Uh, my question, I've got a question for the motion for. Where are you from, against. please? Jazzy from Qatar. Um, for those against, first of all, don't you think it's too late um, to just, you know, give up at this stage? Because, I mean, a generation who was able to create a protest of millions through a Facebook page will not allow such a thing to continue, especially after all those people that died already. Um, we've all seen, for example, the army working hand in hand with the people in Egypt and other countries in this protest. I mean, yes, again, don't you think it's too late? Absolutely, absolutely. I, we are not suggesting that people should give up in their struggle for democracy and rights. Rather, we are trying to outline the type of forces that will be trying to counter. But, but she has those a, she has a point that this is the first Facebook revolution. This is the, what's underlying her question. Yeah, that's true. But then you see, Facebook is not sufficient to actually do things that happen in government. You have to realize. I mean, not you. I mean, everybody has to realize what happened in Egypt you know, people in, this, in the Gulf and other Arab countries have learned from. They have, you know, this, you know, as the, revol the protesters learn, governments also learn, and they know how to handle it. They actually diffuse and they preempt all their movement. We are not against people. We are not against people's rights, but we are saying you do not, you cannot dream. You have to be very practically oriented if you want to affect change. I'd like to go back to the question and ask why you think the revolutions are unstoppable. You clearly do. I think we cannot compare. I mean, um, Ms. Jane gave an example of Saddam Hussein being in power for 12 years without, anything doing anything, without anyone doing anything about it. But it's not the same today. The technology, the youth, the new generation, the, the power that's you know, mixing with all the countries, it's, it's not going to work. I mean, we all know Gaddafi and all the other leaders are momentarily going to leave soon. It's impossible for them to stay for 12 years. And again, my question is, is isn't it too late? I mean, it's too late now to just believe it's, it's not going to work. I don't think it's too late. I think governments, they would still continue working at it. They will still, as I said, they will curb the momentum. What do they do not want to happen? They do not want the momentum to build up to reach a critical mass to affect change. They know it's going to happen 20 years from now, but they want to buy time. They are curbing the momentum. They are cutting, and they are, because they have the money. And as I said, you know, they, you cannot rely on the European Union or the US or the Western powers. One moment you're saying they have their backs to the wall and they're like animals, then yeah. you're having them survive 20 years. They which, can. Which? They, I mean, sorry, you know, I, mean, you, I, mean, I think the, uh, the Gulf countries can survive. And the Gulf countries would make sure that the other Arab countries whose interests are very much deep rooted with them will continue. I mean, they, you have just seen that they are heavily investing in Egypt. The $40 billion promised by the G8, quarter of which will come from the Gulf countries. Anwar Bokhar, do you want to come oh, in? You're abso absolutely right. I mean, for the resistance, as I said, it, it, yeah, no, I mean, it was, <laughs> it, was, it was expected. I mean, look, the Tunisian leader, Ben Ali, I mean, he did not choose not to use force. It's his military, right, that did not obey the orders. Same thing in Egypt. It's not that Mubarak, I mean, did not order his military force to use force. It's his military forces that did not use force. So they're not, the GCC or others, they're not just inventing a new model. Look, two things. This wave of protests are about two things. You're right. There are the riches, and then there is the political legitimacy. You can buy some time with what we call the rentier effect by buying people off. But even in the GCC, there are troubles. I mean, Saudi Arabia cannot fund other countries, Morocco and elsewhere. It has its own problems. They have employment over in Saudi Arabia. Billion. Unemployment in Saudi Arabia is 40%. The youth bulge. Let me, is let me, over let me 40%. come back to the questioner here. I just, I just want to come back to the question. Excuse me. I just want to come back to the questioner here and ask her how far you think that revolutions in this part of the world, in this region, in the Gulf region, can actually go. 
if we talk about the Gulf uh, not being happy with the dictatorship, for example, if one day you believe that people will protest in the Gulf against dictatorship, I don't see that happening because everyone in the Gulf is, or mostly, are happy. And if we're going to talk about... Uh, happy with what? Dictatorship? Happy with, no, it's not dictatorship. That, that's what I mean. I mean, if we say democracy, for me, it's a fancy title, really. We have here freedom of speech more than anyone else. And we have all our rights in terms of, I mean, as a Qatari, I can speak that we have more rights than we deserve. We don't pay for anything. More we rights than you deserve? I think some people might argue with you over that. But if you look at the wider Gulf region, Jen Kinnaman, four, can I just four, bring... four out of the six GCC countries have seen protests this year. Let's, I mean, the Arab Spring is not just about revolution. The Arab Spring is about a transition of the Arab peoples from being subjects to being citizens. Okay, and if we accept that premise, then you can have multiple models in the region coexisting. And it's great that you feel that you can go and ask for your governments. You, your government never gives you more than you deserve. You deserve this and more, you know? And it's the same in Bahrain, you know? I mean, this is, I think, the, this is sort of what the, what the heart of what's happening in the Arab Spring, no one is saying every country is going to go get rid of its dictator. I'm Lebanese. We'd actually have to get rid of 17 dictators in Lebanon, each community. <laughs> you know, I mean, no, but what, what we are saying, what we are saying is what we are witnessing today is history shifting. And if we are stay quiet for a second, we can hear it. I mean, look at us. We're all optimists. Six months ago, probably all of us would have been pessimists. And just think of that. Think of that for a second. Deep down, you feel change is coming. And the other side, when I hear them, you know what I remember? I remember conversations I had in Egypt after Tunisia, because you are right, Tunisians showed us the way. And after Tunisia, Egyptians would say, but it's different here. We're geostrategic. We're too big a player, you know, too big to fail. And then Egypt fell. And then President Bashar al-Assad got on the Wall Street okay, Journal and okay. said, Can we... Syria is different because yeah, the people yeah. love me. And it's the it's same. I so hear it the same. Okay. They it's will the change. Let, they let, will let change. Him, let him come back. It is let not that back. we are too good to fail. I'm not saying that the Gulf not countries too are good, too big to fail. We are not too big to fail. We are not saying that. We just say, well, they have the tools. They have what it needs to make them succeed. They will succeed. They will make this Arab Spring futile. Okay, what I want to do here is just take a, a little sample of opinion from some people in the audience. I just want a sentence from various people, if you'll put your hand up. Uh, we'll get a microphone to you. To answer the question that our questioner here raised, which was basically saying, we've got enough rights here. Why protest? Um, you know, we have uh, all the freedoms that we need. And I want to know whether that view is echoed by other people in the audience. So just, just a sentence, really, just, just a brief view. I think someone's rights are not necessarily the same as someone else's rights. You know, the rights of a Moroccan are not necessarily where, the where, same. Where are you from? I'm from Morocco, as it happens. Uh -huh. you, you, feel, you don't feel you have enough rights, do you? Well, I'm looking at things rather than materialistic. I'm more interested in having, you know, things such as freedom of expression, the freedom to choose, the freedom to decide my future. That's what you'd like to have? Absolutely. Okay, is that view echoed by anybody, anybody else have a view? There's a gentleman there in the fourth row. Hello, I'm uh, from Qatar. I just want to say, why people look uh, for countries above us? Why don't you look for countries below us? That's why she's right. Uh, we have rights more than our rights. Why don't we have uh, look at countries below us? You have all the rights that you want. Yes. And all the rights that you need. Anybody else? Can I have an example of a country that's below us? Excuse below me? them. Oh, know? yes. No, he said below us. Okay, below I them. Mean, like, uh, what, 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 give me an example of a country that you think is below like Qatar, for example. You have in Asia, in Africa, uh, there are many countries below us. I mean, like for, for example, uh, in Qatar we have... Below free, you in what in way? What sense, yeah. I mean, like, for, uh, in Qatar we have free education and free medical services. In the U.S., you know, there's, like, few, a huge conflict between, uh, I mean, the uh, health insurance. And in Qatar we have it for free. So I think she's right. Why do we look for countries above us? Why don't we look for, uh, at countries below us? Okay, anybody else want to make a brief point about the subject that we're discussing? There's a hand up there. Well, all of you here, we've just been talking about the problems in Egypt and in all of the other places in the world. And about Qatar specifically, you can see that everyone here has, like students, have education that is higher than most places in the GCC. Mm. We have a high uh, economy. We have good <coughs> medical care. Honestly, looking at every single other place in the GCC, can you say that Qatar doesn't really have the best kind of like, life for the citizens here? We have all the freedom we can get, we have all the things, and if 
And if we don't, then why hasn't anyone already protested? And you do can, we, can we make a quick point here? Yes, please. Yeah. How many I'd like you to come in. I agree, and I don't think it's a, you know, you're lucky that you're born in Qatar or that you're born in the GCC. You know, you're born with a big uh, a virtual sum in the bank because your country is very rich in natural resources. But what is the percentage of people who work in Qatar, who work in Saudi, who work in the UAE, who are not born in these countries? And do they benefit? Uh, from the free health care? Do they benefit from all these rights? Do they benefit? Okay, I'm just going to take a comment from right. the original questioner on this issue. Can we <laughs> get a microphone to you? One very brief comment. Uh, I think our, we don't thank God we're Qatari because we have a big uh, amount in the bank or because of the petrol. A lot of other countries do have a lot of money. It's how our leaders invest in us. That's what we're proud of. And that's why we won't protest. The education they provide us, I mean, Education City, Aspire, the medical care, these are things that are not because they have money. A lot of other countries have money. That's because they care about their people. They care about how we will uh, turn out in the end. And that's my point. Okay, Thank you. we're going to move on and take some questions from elsewhere now. The gentleman there has a question. I find it difficult to understand the Where argument. Where are you from, please? Oh, sorry, my name is Mahjoub Zwari from Qatar University. Um, I find it difficult to understand the argument of the um, opposition of the motion because basically um, any debate, any discussion about Arab Spring should keep in mind that this is a process. Mm -hmm. It will take time, of course. And, and this time, obviously, people would not happen. I mean, this kind of change would not happen if people sit at home. Basically, they need to move. Yeah. This movement will lead to people demonstrate. Yeah. They may, they will clash, you see clashes in the street, people they may kill. This is the nature of the, uh, yeah. the, the revolution. So basically, you cannot say that, you know, this, you know there is no hope for this. Because basically, no, not, they didn't say that. Let me finish. Because basically, you are speaking about democratization or, or changing. Mm. ABC change is actually people demonstrating. People go outside, people express their ideas. So basically, in the nature of your discourse, there is a problem of um, the time definition. Frame here you cannot, a contradiction as well. You cannot speak about democratization without people demonstration and express their ideas. Okay, Jen Kinnaman. I think if you're misunderstanding our argument. We are not saying that there is no hope for change or that setbacks mean that there will never be democracy. What we're saying is that the, for, the resistance forces do have a lot of tricks up their sleeves. They want to survive, they want to maintain power, and they will have some successes. Even if they're not victorious in the long run, uh, there's a great quote from The Economist, John Maynard Keynes, which is, in the long run, we are all dead. If I'm a, but, a dictator but okay, let, let, fighting let, let, let for survival, you. Let this let five years nine, is worth it This happens. This happened in 1979. Iran, the, under the Shah, he resisted, 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 yes. and, and at the end of the day, he, he left. Yes. So, of, of course, the, but the, at the end of the day, people won the battle structure. and there they established, that, regardless of European and the regime. You had a but you need, they to, had think, funding. You need to, you know, to the to the you wording of the motion. Nobody can hear. The wording of the we motion. At the, same time. the wording of the motion is not uh, resistance is ultimately doomed in the long term. The wording of the motion is resistance is futile. And it's not entirely futile. Regimes are able to buy themselves time. That matters to them, and they will fight for it. Okay, I'm going to take a question from the lady in the third row. Uh, my name is Aisha. I'm from uh, Libya. T to a Libyan and to somebody who um, is seeing events unfold uh, all over the region, I don't think that it makes any sense to say that you know, the dictators can resist because if anybody, if there was an example of, Gaddafi you know, a is hopeless resisting, situation. Isn't he? Gaddafi is resisting somewhat. He, he, he's, he's resisting, but I mean, he's, he's definitely losing power. And I mean, I think that the how world... Long, how long do you give him? How long do I give him? Well, I hope tonight, but I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> I agree with you. Every country is different, though. Uh, and I think um, in, in Yemen and maybe in Libya, um, it is a, a matter of a very short-term amount of time uh, for these rulers. But that's not the case looking across the whole region. I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I just want to say that, okay, it's not the case across all regions, but I wanted to point out that the case, the situation in Libya was, I think, probably one of the most... Uh, it, 
I mean the oppression that was yes. happening in the country for 42 years. So if the Libyan people can do it, and we are not a large nation, we are no more than 7 million people, and we are being met by violence up until today, you know, and, and they are doing it, and they are yeah. rising, so it is futile to... I think okay. resist the Arab Spring. All right, um, we're going to vote on the motion in a moment, but before we do that, I want to just go round each of the panelists in a semicircle and ask them for a sentence to sum up their views before you do get to vote. So if I could start with you, Anwar Bukhas. Sir, the Very briefly, a sentence. Sure, the, the thrust of today's uh, wave of protests is, is less about economic grievances, is less about identity, but it's more about, uh, it's more about political legitimacy. That's what it's all about. Nadim Khoury. The wall of fear has been broken in the region, and a new generation, a younger generation, has made its arrival to the political scene. The genie is out of the bottle. It's not going to be an easy ride. Not all countries are going to same, follow the same path, but change has come, and whoever tries to resist that change is fooling themselves and preparing themselves to go to The Hague to be tried. Okay. Ahmed Ali Mukheni. For the time being, Resistance to the Arab Spring is not futile. It will bear fruit because they have the authority, they have the money, they have the power, and they will make it happen. You will see lots of lots of lives. Jane Kinnaman. I'll just remind you, this is not a vote on whether you support the Arab Spring. It's a vote on whether the resistance is futile or whether the resistance can be effective. I think the, the democracy activists have to believe that they'll win if they're ever going to be successful, but they also have to recognize how powerful the forces against them are in order to tackle them. Okay. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to vote now on the motion. This House believes resistance to the Arab Spring is futile. Would you just take your voting machines? Let me just explain to you how they work. If you want to vote for the motion, that is the side represented by those on my right, you're going to need to press button one. If you want to vote against the motion, the side represented by those on my left, it's button two. Whichever button you want to press, would you please press it now? You only have to press it once. Through the miracles of modern science, your vote will be transmitted to the computers and we should have it for you in just over 20 seconds' time. All right, there we have it. 73% for the motion, 27% against. The motion has been resoundingly carried. Congratulations. Well done. You had a tough side. You had an easy task. You had a tough side. <laughs> All that remains for me to do is to thank our distinguished panelists. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you to you, the audience, for your questions. That's it from the Doha Debates team. Thanks very much for coming tonight. Thank you. Safe journey home. Good night. Good night.